I am Anna Seewald, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about growing ourselves while raising our children. I'm a psychologist, educator, and parent coach. And on this podcast, I explore how you can connect to your authentic self, practice radical self-care, and raise emotionally healthy children. Let's break the generational cycle of trauma for a more peaceful, kind, and compassionate world. Today, consent, online grooming, pornography, and keeping children safe. I have two guests. My first guest is a dear friend in real life. Her name is Marcy Aboff. She's a children's author. And Holly Ann Martin, the founder and managing director of Safe for Kids, with over 35 years of experience in teaching child abuse prevention education. From the importance of teaching children the correct anatomical parts to talking with children about pornography, in this episode we talk about how to help children create their safety team, what to do if your child has seen pornography, why do children need to have a feelings vocabulary, why it's so important to teach children about consent, things you need to know about online grooming, what your child might see on YouTube for kids, and how seemingly innocent search terms can lead to inappropriate results, and tips on deepening your connection and trust with your children. As I said, Marcy Aboff is a children's author. We will be talking about her book, Uncle Tony's Tickles. And Holly Ann is from Australia. She has presented the thought-provoking Safe for Kids program at over 30 conferences to audiences across the globe, from the United Kingdom and the United States of America to every state and territory of Australia, Indonesia, Mexico, and Qatar. Holly Ann was inducted into the Western Australia's Hall of Fame in 2016 in recognition of her work in education and her passion for child abuse prevention. In 2022, she was awarded an Order of Australia Medal for service to children by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Please enjoy. So ladies, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm super excited to meet you, Holly Ann. I love your accent. And Marcy is, is a friend. But I'm curious how the two of you have met. Well, I've written a child abuse prevention program for childcare centers. And I came across Marcy's book years ago and included it in my program. And we were just buying it off Amazon, paying you know the Amazon prices. But shipping used to kill me because people can tell I'm from Australia, hopefully. And then it went out of it was no longer available on Amazon. So I thought, I need this book. I need this book for my program. So I tracked her down through LinkedIn, ironically, and then she had some stock in her own home. So she was sending me that, and then she was running out of that stock. So I still wanted to continue using her book in my program. And so what I did was we reached out to her and said, look, would you be happy for us to do a joint venture where we use your words we're happy to pay for new illustrations and so we've been able to revamp the book it used to be called Uncle Willie's Tickles and now it's called Uncle Tony's Tickles but everything else is Marcy's beautiful work and we're thrilled to be able to work together across you know two continents to keep this book going because we really believe that it's got a lot of value. Wow that's interesting yeah I do love the book too and I think the new version came out really lovely. Yeah, no, we're thrilled with it because the young illustrator, he was really easy to work with and, and stuff like that. I've only ever, because I've written five books myself and I've always used the same artist who was a lady I could go and talk to and see, but he's from overseas and he was just a delight to work with. And we're really thrilled with the new, you know, fresh look of it. Mm. And Marcy, I don't know What's the inspiration behind the book? When did you write the book and what was the impetus for this book? Well, this was back in 
in the mid 1990s when I just started writing. I had a few magazine stories published, but I saw a news story where a young girl was being abused by her stepfather and it was she was actually being molested and the mother Uh, from what I understand from the news accounts, also knew what was going on. And they just unfortunately let it go on. And this young girl was tragically killed. And it just affected me so much how, you know, by the abuse of her stepfather. And it just, I also remember this young girl, she had this beautiful mass of curls and she looked just like my daughter at the time, my youngest, who was about four or five. And I just felt like so sad that young children, they just don't have a voice. So I did some research about good touches and bad touches, and I wanted to write something about the topic. So I did, I wrote a story, you know, like I said, I did some research about other books that were out there and there wasn't many at the time. They were also like nonfiction, very dry, not very engaging. So I wrote Uncle Willie's Tickles at that time, which is Uncle Tony's Tickles now. And I sent it out to publishers and the American Psychological Association sent me a letter and they called me and they really loved it and they wanted to publish it. So it was my first published book. And I was very, you know, and I was very excited to have it published, especially by them. Yeah, that's huge. And what a story. As a young mom, I could imagine how it moved you and touched you and what a terrifying story that is. And it should never happen to children. And in a few words, could you describe what your book is about for children? What's the age category that you wrote that book for? Okay. Yes, it's a picture book. So it's basically for children four to eight in that range. And it's about a young boy named Kyle. And his uncle, who he loves dearly, he loves his uncle is funny and they, you know, play checkers and all these different games together. And he takes him out for ice cream and they just, he's just his favorite uncle. But his his uncle likes to tickle, tickles Kyle, he tickles his sister, he tickles the cousins and the sister thinks it's funny. She likes it. But Kyle is uncomfortable and he doesn't know what to do because he loves his uncle, but he feels very uncomfortable when his uncle starts tickling him. And he's just tickling him. He's not, the uncle doesn't realize that it bothers Kyle. So Kyle thinks of ways to hide when his uncle is visiting. And so he ends up telling his mother finally how he feels. And his mother tells him, you know, nobody has a right to touch you or tickle you in a way you don't like. So let's go tell him, we can tell him together. And he does, he tells his uncle with the support of his mom and his uncle, who's very surprised because his uncle's not, doesn't realize, and he's not doing anything wrong necessarily, or he's not doing anything that other kids might think he's not doing anything where like the sister thinks it's okay, but he just, Kyle is just his own boundaries. He feels uncomfortable. So he's able to tell his uncle and express himself. And then his uncle says, well, you know, give me a high five. And I promise I'm so glad you told me and I won't do it anymore. So it's a springboard. The story can be read as is, or it could be taken to that next step to sit, to talk about good touches and bad touches and boundaries and bullying. And just that there are people you can go to. And I love the way Holly Ann expresses this in her other books. And she also has a book for parents that there's always somebody there that a child can go to and to be persistent. If it's not one adult, go to another one, another children's safety team. I'll let Holly talk more about that. Yeah, I was going to say your story is so mild and you said it's a springboard, nothing like the news story that you saw in the news. And I'm glad. And I'm going to ask Holly, what I love about the book is that this little boy goes to his mom and the mom supports him and it has a positive ending. The uncle understands the message. But in reality, Holly, unfortunately, that's not the case, right, for many children. No, that's right. And as Marcy mentioned, that's why we help children set up a safety team of five adults that they can talk to. And if the first person you tell doesn't listen, then you keep telling. What Marcy's book, for me, the reason I love it so much is we have a big emphasis on consent. 
And, you know, it's a great springboard into talking about consent and body boundaries. And whenever I talk about consent on my Facebook page, people get really irate because I say, we've got to start consent when children are, you know, babies. And people say, oh, don't be ridiculous. You're sick and you're sexualizing children because they think consent's about sexuality, consent's about body autonomy. And so, you know, we do need to teach my book that I've written that's quite similar to Marcy's is my story from when I was a little girl and I had an uncle who used to take out his teeth and go, give me a kiss, give me a kiss with no teeth in. And, of course, the kids love it because they have the whole class doing that, you know, pretending they've got no teeth. But, again, it's about why I like Marcy's book is we don't need to be confronting and scary because that turns both parents and especially teachers off. We can still give kids very clear messages without being the boogeyman that's going to frighten them and things like that. So we teach them that you're the boss of your body and nobody should be touching you without your permission, without your consent. If they do, you tell somebody on your safety team. So, you know, this is just one part of a 10-part a lesson plan that I've created because I believe that we need to start protective education from three at the latest with children. And I also believe that we need to start talking about pornography with children from six at the latest. Again, we do it in an age-appropriate way. I don't call it pornography with six-year-olds. We call them private pictures and private movies. But everything can be done really sensitively, but in a way that children understand it without parents freaking out and going, oh, if you talk about pornography, you'll turn my child onto it. I love that reframing and even the terminology protective education as opposed to child abuse prevention, or it seems like a lot has changed probably since you started this work. And I know you've been doing this work for many decades. So I am really surprised and shocked to hear that at the earliest we need the age to talk about pornography is six. I'm surprised and not surprised, I have to say. In the earliest age, you said three, to start protective education. Yeah. Say more about that. And so that's just simple things like, again, teaching about consent, teaching children, you know, from as early as they can talk, the anatomical names for their body parts. We need to get away from this being your rude part. So, you know, teaching them to say, you know, mouth, penis, bottom, vagina, vulva, testicles. If parents do it from when their children are babies, it's less daunting than trying to teach it to them when they're 11 or 12 because, you know, kids don't want to hear it by that age. But if kids just know those words straight up from, you know, this is a nose and this is an elbow, it's not scary and it normalises, you know, the language a simple thing is teaching children to giving them a feelings vocab. When I'm working with 12-year-olds in school, many of them only have four feelings, happy, sad, angry, and scared. So, you know, for parents to model the language of feelings, I'm so proud of the way you did that. I'm really annoyed you're not listening to me. When it's done in context, if you think, I'm sure uh, the US is similar to Australia, but here in Australia, if a two-year-old says the F word, somebody will laugh and then they say the F word all the time. But kids aren't hearing feelings words, they're hearing those words, so then they're not perhaps using them in context. So if we can teach children in context to name their feelings, you know, all of these things can be protective factors because people that prey on children look for vulnerable children and available children. Any child that's online is automatically both, but they know who to prey on. They know who to groom. If children are using the correct anatomical names for their body parts, they've done studies with predators in jail, and they say if a child's using the correct words, they're more likely to leave that child alone than a child that's calling it a mini or a cookie or a you know something else because it's going to be harder for children to be understood. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. When you said about the safety team, I know that you talk to a lot of children, thousands of children every year. You teach your program, which is wonderful. What do they say? Who is on their safety team most frequently? Do they include their parents? Well, usually, yes. So I do it to sort of a formula. So on the thumb would be anybody from their home. We use the hand because it's with us all the time. So on the thumb are people from their home. So if they want mum and dad or grandma, whoever adult that lives in their home goes on the thumb. 
And then on the next two fingers would be two people from either daycare or school, depending which environment they go to. And then on the last two fingers are two people from the community. So uncles and aunts, grandparents, next door neighbours, people from church, friends of their parents, their friends' parents, just any other adult. So what we're trying to do is give kids a wider spread of different people from different environments that will help them. Sometimes, however, I do have children say, I don't want anybody from my home on my safety team because some kids are feeling really disconnected. Some kids will say, oh, you know, I don't want my mum or my dad because mum's always on Facebook or dad comes to my cricket match and he never watches. He's always on his phone. So that's what I mean about the connections with that people that prey on children look for kids without those connections. So I really encourage parents. I know parents are busy, but one of the things I encourage parents to do is, you know, make just 10 minutes a day to check in with your child, hear about their day, tell children that, you know, so our program's based around two themes. We all have the right to feel safe all the time and we could talk to someone about anything. And sometimes kids have these huge problems to them, but an adult goes, kid, that's not a big problem. But to that little person, it's a big problem. So if we don't make time to hear the little problems, kids go, well, I need to talk to them about that other thing and they were too busy. I'm not going to tell them the bad thing that's happening to me. And we need to give kids permission to tell us the bad things. I know so many people always say, a lot of parents, in fact, say, I want my children to come to me when there is something serious or important in their life or when they're dealing with something. But you're right. If we don't build that connection and fortify that path, that ground for connection and conversation ongoing, right? They're not going to come to us with big ticket items. It starts small. It builds the trust, the connection. It keeps it that fire going. And so when they need something, something is happening. They can really, without thinking, come to us, to the parents. That's exactly right. Children, they can only go on their past life experiences. Please tell me I'm not special, but hey, either of you had the experience where, because I do it all the time, I'll have words with my husband in the morning about something, I'll go to work, and then as I'm driving home, I go, right, when I go home, we're going to have this out, and I'm going to say this, and then he'll come back with that, and then I'm going to stick it with that, and I have this conversation in my head. When I come home, I say whatever I was going to say, and my husband will go, oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> go, I've just had an, I've had an hour's argument in my head, and it didn't go like that. Children have, you know, do the same things. They have these, they know from, you know, if mum went mad about something, then they're going to go the same way. So we need to make time for children and just hear those little things because then the kids will know that they can tell them the big things as well. Yeah. What are some tips would you give to parents in this area? I know, I mean, listening is good. Put away your phone, listen and show up, that kind of stuff. But when children say, especially when they share something alarming, you know, how do you want parents to respond? But that response can make a big difference. Definitely. I have my own podcast and I was interviewing a young man from the US who at 14 was addicted to pornography. And I interviewed him when he was 16. And then again, just recently when he's just now, he's just turned 18. And he gave me one of the best tips I've ever heard. And in his family, he has something called the no trouble bubble. So how that works is, say a child had been looking at pornography, come across it by accident or a kid at school showed them, what happens is they go to their parent and they say, I'm calling the no trouble bubble. And so what happens is, so as soon as they say that, the parent knows to rein it in and not go berserk, but they say they get told they're loved, they get an eight second hug, and then the parent says, and we'll deal with it tomorrow after we've both had a good night's sleep. I just love this idea. Now, kids might get to sleep. Parents are not going to be sleeping. They're going to be Googling, my kids saw pornography. What am I going to do about it? But that way you can deal with it when you're calm. Because if you go mad at the child, again, if they just tell you that, you know, it's so important that they know that they can do it. The other thing it's really important to know is parents at the end of my, because I do a face-to-face -face parent workshops and I also have a parent workshop online, and I always end my workshop with the greatest fear for any parent must be, what if my child told me they were being sexually abused? Now, realistically, it may not be your child telling you. It's more likely to be your child's best friend telling you. 
because kids just want to keep their parents safe. They want to protect them. Those dear little people that parents duck into bed every night think they have to parent the parents sort of thing. And because of the grooming process, they might be told we're going to hurt your family or, you know, things like that. So what I say to parents is if a child comes to you and says something's happened, you have to stay calm. But when has ever telling somebody, stay calm, when has that ever worked? <laughs> but what we need to say is to try and stay calm. So what I teach adults to say is, I'm glad you told me, I believe you, it's not your fault, and I'm going to do something about it. And so just by knowing those four sentences, hopefully, by the time you've got those out, you've composed yourself and then you need to follow it up with the local authorities and report it to, here in Australia, we would report it to either the police or our Department for Child Protection. But just knowing those four sentences, and I actually have it on a free poster that I'll email to you. And if you want to put it in the show notes, I recommend people, you know, print it off and put it up at the doctor's surgery and at the childcare centre and because we need everybody to know. So you stay calm. We have to believe all children. A lot of people say children lie about this, but evidence shows us kids don't lie about this. There may be a very small percentage that do, but that's we have to believe all children. It's not our job to investigate. And then we need to reassure the child that you're going to do something about it and then follow it up with your authorities. So that's all on this poster if, if you think that that would be useful to put in the show notes. That would be, yeah. Thank you so much. So what's the average age of a child that gets exposed to pornography these days? Well, research says 11. It's three years out of date. In my experience, the average age is nine, but children, six-year-olds are coming across it on YouTube. And there's so much pornography on YouTube. And even YouTube for kids isn't 100% safe. Personally, I've seen some horror and violent stuff on YouTube for kids. Other people tell me they've seen pornography on YouTube for kids. But a lot of parents, I know there's a big controversy at the moment with the TikTok going to be shut down possibly and, and things like that. But a lot of parents say, Holly, my kids don't go on TikTok, but my child's on YouTube. People just take their TikToks and put it on YouTube short. So they're going to be seeing this stuff. Every little girl loves Elsa from the movie Frozen. If a six-year-old types in Elsa into YouTube, eventually she's going to come across a video with two adults, one dresses Elsa, one dresses Spider-Man, having sex and having twins. Oh, and man. So I'm glad you're both horrified because it is shocking. The porn industry is targeting children. And you can put in the most innocent searches and still this stuff come up. So I call them private pictures or private movies. And it's done as part of the public and private lesson where we talk about rooms in your home that are private, then things that you do with your body that's private. So here we cover swearing and things like that. You don't swear at school because it's a public place. And then we talk about private pictures and private movies. And when I'm brainstorming with five and six-year-olds, where might children see pictures or movies people no clothes on? Five-year-olds can tell me, YouTube's usually first, TikTok second, and then it's Netflix and all of the live streaming things, Instagram, Snapchat. I don't put the words in their mouths, but I was in a, a school and a dear little five-year-old put up a hand and said, on Snapchat, miss. And I said, sweetie, you're five. How do you know about Snapchat? Oh, my foot and your sister's using it? Obviously for sending nudes, because how did a five-year-old know that? And then I was in another school and a five-year-old little boy put up his hand and said, it's easy, Holly. You just type in X, X, X. Oh. <laughs> I know, right? And then I was in a very affluent area and a, a little girl put up her hand and said, it's easy, miss. You just ask Siri. <laughs> and these are all five answers from five-year-olds. I don't put the words in their mouths. They know where they can see it. So we talk about it's not healthy for your brain if you see pictures or moves with no clothes on. And six-year-olds love brain science. So I get the whole class to join up their fingertips or palms facing you, fingertips together. And I say, our brains are made up of millions and millions of connections. But if you see pictures or moves with people no clothes on, it changes the connection. So I turn one hand over so the palm's facing away. And I say, it changes the connections in your brain. It also releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine. And our brain loves it. And a little bit of dopamine is okay for our brain. So if you eat chocolate, a little bit of dopamine. Or if you're running around, a little bit of dopamine. But if you see pictures or movies of people no clothes on, it's like a flood of this dopamine and your brain loves it. But in big amounts, it's not healthy for your brain. 
And you know how we have to put healthy food into our body to grow up big and strong? We need to help put healthy pictures into our mind to grow up big and strong. So people think if you talk about it, you're going to turn them on to it. But it's quite the opposite. It's about if you see pictures like that, you need to go and show an adult what you saw, not just tell an adult, but you need to physically go and show the grown up. Don't look at it yourself, but turn it over and then go and show an adult what you saw. Because children are describing when I work with them in class, they don't know the word flashback, but they say, Holly, that picture just pops into my mind and I keep thinking about it and thinking about it. I've had children, you know, they think that dad is doing that to mum. I have children, I had a a psychologist from the other side of Australia ring me up talking about some of my other books. And she said, look, Holly, let me just run this past you. I'm counselling a young 10-year-old girl who won't go to sleep at night. I've had five sessions with this girl and I can't get to the bottom of why she won't go to sleep. I said, that's easy. Ask if she's seen pictures or moves people no clothes on. She rings me back a couple of days later and said, how did you know? This little girl had seen the most graphic, heinous stuff that every time she shut her eyes, she was picturing it in her mind. So she wouldn't go to sleep at night. She would just be up all night until she crashed because she didn't want to shut her eyes because of the pictures that she saw. And this psychologist said, Holly, I've spoken to so many of my colleagues about this. We're not talking about this. No, it's not on anybody's radar. How do you know? And I said, because kids are telling me about this stuff. In class, I had a class of 24 seven-year-olds And I do the lesson, the public and private lesson. And at the end of the lesson, I had eight of the 24 kids stay behind or to talk to me. And I said, look, come on, it's playtime. Off you go and play. They said, no, miss, we need to talk to you now. And each of them came up privately one at a time, all telling me how they'd seen these images on YouTube. That's a quarter of the seven-year-olds in one class. So that's why I'm so adamant that we need to talk about this as early as possible And parents will say, my kids don't go on YouTube or YouTube for kids. And, you know, we've got all of these safety devices and all this sort of stuff. And that's great. But don't forget the kid across the road or the kid on the bus has got a phone and is going to be showing your child. So you have to, you want your children to be able to tell you anything and come and show you if they see inappropriate stuff. Yeah, I like that part about showing because for kids, especially younger kids, they don't have the language to describe what they sew. That's a pretty helpful tip right there. But what if the image disappeared or something like that? I mean, well, that's why I say to turn it over. I used to say go and tell an adult, but you're exactly right. Kids don't have the language. And if they say to a parent, I saw pictures of people with no clothes on, That's not what they saw. They're not going to be able to describe choking or any of the really graphic stuff that we know is now in pornography nowadays. But back when we had, here in Australia, when COVID hit and we went into lockdown, it was early March 2020, I was in my office and somebody had come across child exploitation material on Instagram and didn't know how to deal with it. So they've put at Safe for Kids, which is me, at FBI, at Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, which is where it will eventually go in the US. But I get at these messages all the time. So I just open up this random message, could not believe what I was seeing. I burst into tears, but I still had enough wherewithal to go, right, I need to take a screenshot of the guy's face, but not what he was doing to the children, a screenshot of his Instagram account. I go back out to take a screenshot of who had sent it to me, but it had disappeared. So then I go on to our federal police's website and I make a report and, oh, by the way, I've got these photos and I'm crying and I'm typing it all up, what what was happening. I hit send and send that off to them. I then go up into the house and tell my husband exactly what I saw. Now, I think I can tell a story. And so I'm telling him exactly. And at the end of what I was saying, my husband goes, oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> just like that <laughs> I'm crying I'm a, a basket case and all you give him is oh yeah I now see it as a gift because if I couldn't articulate to my husband the severity of what I saw and why wasn't he as shocked as I was how are children supposed to describe it so that's why I say you must show them what you know if possible but they're to flip it over And so if they're on an iPad, to flip it over, or if they're on a screen, turn off the screen. If they lose it, not to go looking for it again, but then to tell. But also, I also tell kids about 
if they are having flashbacks, if that picture keeps popping into your mind, then you're to close your eyes and you're to reboot your brain. So make a picture of something that you like to see or you like to do in your mind. So it might be rainbows or unicorns, rainbow unicorns or cricket or Lego or, or soccer or whatever kids like. Picture that in your mind to reboot it. Kids understand this technology talk. So we're trying to give them strategies if they do have flashbacks, but to definitely, definitely tell somebody on their safe team. And if they think their parent won't, you know, will take their iPad away, then to tell somebody else, like those eight children that I told you that stayed back in that had seen pornography on YouTube, not one of them had told a parent that they'd seen these images for fear of getting into trouble or that their parent would take their device away. They wouldn't let them go on YouTube. So the other tip for parents is please don't use technology as a punishment because, you know, clean your room or I'll take your iPad away. Stop fighting with your sister or I'll take your iPad away. Because if kids see harmful, whether it's violent, horror or private pictures, they won't tell an adult or show an adult because they think their parent will take it away because parents have already modelled that they will. So what would be a way for a parent to ask their children if they have seen any private pictures, like with young children, and then we can go into slightly older children because the conversation must be different for different age. You can't go to my 14-year-old and say, have you seen private pictures? <laughs> She would laugh at me, right? Exactly. But what would you recommend for a parent how to ask that question of a young child? Well, I find books and I've written two books to be able to talk to parents, for parents to talk to their children about that, because sometimes even if parents are uncomfortable having these conversation, a book, if you're reading a book, so I've written two books to be able to do that. And there are another couple books. What are the books you just mentioned, please, all of your books? So I've got one about, so it's called Matilda Learns a Valuable Lesson. And it's my story from with my uncle taking out his teeth. And then I've got one about public and private where a little boy looks over a wall at a little girl going to the toilet. And it's how I teach about, it's how we introduce the public and private body parts. Then the first one I wrote about pornography is called Hayden Reese Learned to Do What to Do If He'd See Private Pictures or Private Movies. The third, fourth one I wrote was about children abusing other children because Children exhibiting harmful sexual behavior on other children, in my experience, is on the increase because kids are seeing pornography, not knowing how to process it, and then acting it out on other children. So that book is called Gary Just Didn't Know the Rules, and the teacher teaches the class that there are five private rules. No one's allowed to touch your private parts unless it's for medical reasons or hygiene. If somebody did, it wouldn't be your fault you're not allowed to touch anybody else's private parts. If you do, you're breaking the law. No one's allowed to show you private pictures. No one's to take private pictures of you. And you're not to take private pictures of yourself. And then my fifth one is called Someone Should Have Told Me. So it's about pornography, but it's also about other cyber issues. So the first picture is, I wish somebody had told me not to type private words into the computer. And so he's typed in bum and there's all of these, like there's a picture of a kid in front of a computer and there's a, a potato in the shape of a bottom sort of thing. So it's to help adults. So the idea with that book is one page, one conversation, a night sort of thing. I wish somebody had told me not to talk to people on the internet, even if they look nice. So on one page, there's a kid look, thinking that he's talking to a child, but on the other page, he's actually talking to the big bad wolf because kids, you know, they know that story sort of thing. And so, again, in child-friendly ways, it's to have these conversations. But if parents don't want to, you know, buy a book or something, just to go, oh, I was even just like, oh, I was listening to this podcast and this lady was saying that that some children have been, you know, seeing pictures of movies with people with no clothes on. Have you ever had that experience or doing it in a third person? Have any of your friends ever, you know, told you that they've seen pictures like that? And then with older children, just to be upfront with it, Um, and say, I hear that, you know, the average age of kids knowing going to look for pornography is nine. You know, people, we're not trying to body shame them and things like that, but parents need to have those conversations, especially with their 14-year-olds. When I'm working with 14-year-old young men in high school, they tell me they're watching two hours a week of pornography. Now, if they're going to admit to two hours, they're watching way more. They're just going to tell the old lady at the front, it's only two hours and play it down a bit. And I say, fellas, why would you look at that? 
oh, Holly, to learn technique or to learn style. Stop right there. <laughs> That's not the right technique and there's no style. But there's no kissing. There's no foreplay. There's no pleasure for women. 88% of the pornography that is produced is violence against women. There is no consent. And so that's why I'm so passionate about teaching consent from a baby because we need our 14. It's too late by the time they're 14 to be talking about consent. It's already been ingrained. So if they grow up knowing that they're the boss of their body and they've got to ask to, you know, to hug. I even ask kids, if can I give you a high five? I don't just put up my hand. I'm so over the top about this consent. But we have to talk to young, both young fellas and young ladies about what they're seeing in pornography because, you know, it's not a real life situation. And there's a certain sex act in these movies that you need a lot of consent around. And in my experience, young people that think that's totally normal and everybody's up for that and without any negotiation or anything like that. So here in Australia, we think we're so progressive, but our sex education is really lacking and from what I hear in America sometimes sex education is abstinent in some states and things like that so you know we're failing young people when we're not having these you know we say my thing is we can talk about anything but we're not talking about the anything that young people want to talk about. I want to ask you about grooming because it's a big topic I personally had to google in order to learn because there was an incident in my online community, you know, and I discovered that I knew so little about it. And that gave me an opportunity to talk to my daughter about it. Once I learned certain things, I brought up the topic and we had a conversation and I am, you know, shameful to admit that that was the first time that I had that conversation with my kid because I was also ignorant or oblivious. So what is grooming? What are the signs? What it might look like and what parents need to know to protect their children? You're exactly right. It's so complex. So you've got grooming in the real world, which starts off with perpetrators may even groom families first to get access to children. And one of the questions I'm often asked in my face-to-face training is, Holly, how would I know if somebody was grooming my child? And I basically say, if anybody's wanting to spend more time with your kid than you, ask the question. But it's so, they are so masterful at it. It's one of the things we teach children is about their early warning signs, the body signals that we get when we feel unsafe. So it's our fight, flight, freeze, faint or fawn response. And so with children, we, you know, we talk about the butterflies in the tummy, the heart racing, their legs feel like jelly. And I've got lots of activities that I do with them to get them to feel that. As adults, we would call it intuition, gut feeling, the sixth sense, all of those sorts of things. But basically, sometimes we don't listen to our body. We listen to our head and it will say, oh, you know, I've been listening to your podcast and now I think everybody's a, you know, perpetrator and a predator and all this sort of stuff. But we need to listen to our bodies and we need to be really clear that it's not kids' jobs to keep themselves safe. It is our jobs as adults to keep kids safe. But kids are the last line of defense. So adults need to listen to their bodies. And if they're at a, you know, something and they get that, oh, that's a bit creepy, trust your guts. In fact, I have a T-shirt that's got listen to kids, believe kids and trust your guts on it, which I wear all the time because, you know, we also call them red flags. And in fact, I've just written some songs with Aboriginal kids in remote communities. And one of them is about red flags. And because online grooming is even more tricky Online grooming of children here in Australia, and I can't think it would be any different in the US, but here in Australia, online grooming of children is up 122% in the last three years because of COVID and kids are online. And so perpetrators are going into games like Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite, pretending to be other kids. And then they're offering them things called V-Bucks or Robux. Money. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Virtual dollars. And so I know of a case here, I've been working with this dad here in Australia whose 10-year-old was offered V-Bucks for naked pictures. But what happened was, and one of the things I teach parents is to talk to their children, if anybody wants you to get off of the game onto another app like WhatsApp or Telegram, another platform where they can talk to you, that should be a red flag. If anybody starts to ask you any personal questions. Now, a lot of kids, because they're, this is their job. They do it day in, day out. 
they're so tricky and they'll say to kids oh you know what do you do after school and the kids say oh well I do this so then they know that they've got a school age child and things like that because kids you know if they said where do you live a child's not likely to say where they live but they're likely to say what football team they play for or you know things like that quite innocent so if people start asking you any private questions like have you ever kissed anyone or you know, things that are just taking children out of their comfort zone just a little bit should be a red flag. The fastest growing cybercrime here in Australia at the moment is sextortion of teenage young men. Our federal police are receiving 100 reports of this a month. Their young men from 11 to 17 will get sent a naked picture and then they say, I've sent you one, now you send me one. And because boys' frontal lobes aren't fully formed, they just take a picture of their private part and send it. And then they're instantly comes back right I've got this picture you need to send me five thousand dollars or I'm going to expose it and show it to everybody in your contacts list and then what's happening from there is they say well I don't have five thousand dollars please please don't say you know, don't show anybody and then what's happening is they say well five hundred dollars kids still don't have that now kids should never ever if they get these messages ever pay any money because they're still going to expose them and it will still keep getting blackmailed but the kids will say, I've got no money. So what the predators are saying is, well, if you've got no money, then you need, either need to send me more pictures of yourself. Better still, go and video your little brothers and sisters naked and send me that. And this is organised crime. People are, if you picture the old Indian call centres, people are sitting in these places doing this day in, day out. And Marcy follows my Facebook page so she's probably seen me sharing a lot of stuff about sextortion just recently but I shared something quite recently and a lady contacted me from the other side of Australia and said Holly you must keep talking about this please please don't give up this you know bang on about it all the time because a 17 year year old in my street just last week took his own life because of sextortion. Oh my goodness I got sick to my stomach this this is unbelievable. And you know, they're not, you know, they're not topics that people want to talk about. But again, that's why we say we can talk about anything, because if we don't talk about these things, then it's just going underground and predators are just preying on children, both in the real world and online. Now, the reason that we, I got into this program was teaching this program was back in the 80s and 90s, we used to treat stranger danger. Only about 10% of sexual abuse is by a stranger. 90% is by somebody that is known and possibly loved by the child. But now the internet is, you know, we used to talk to kids about, you know, a white van driving around a park trying to kidnap children. The internet is now the white van and predators don't need to be in a white van. They just need to be online and then they can groom children really easily and to get these images And kids just, unless adults have had these conversations, kids are very easily drawn into this sort of stuff. Yeah, probably young children even more so, right? They're so gullible. Yeah, our federal police have said children as young as four getting their iPads and taking pictures of their own body parts. Unbelievable. Well, as we get to the tail end of our conversation here, you know, I can talk to you for hours. You are a wealth of knowledge and you have so many wonderful, helpful tips. But first of all, I would love for you to tell the listener where they can find you online. You mentioned your Facebook. What's the best place to follow you for advice and things that you share? So it's all safe. The number four kids, K-I-D-S, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, I have a YouTube channel with loads of free training for parents and stuff on, and that's just the Safe for Kids YouTube channel. I've also written 11 songs with Aboriginal Kids Out Bush based on our program, which are really great conversation starters. So we've got one about sextortion, about keep your private parts private, early warning signs. There's one, and, you know, songs are another great way of showing young people those because it takes the pressure off, oh, what do you think to that song that kids wrote? because they're kids learning from other children. So, yeah, everything's just on Safe for Kids and all my, because my books are quite expensive to send to the US, they're all on Amazon. So if people wanted to check out any of my books, if they just go onto Amazon and look for Holly-Ann Martin, all of my books will be listed under my name. 
Yeah, we have a lot of Aussie listeners. I'm sure they will check you out too. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's end on a bit of a positive note and maybe what are some of your best tips or to-go tips that you share with people or a hopeful message or something of that nature to, I feel mortified hearing to the last story. <laughs> But just for parents, just to, you know, cherish their children and make time. I know parents are busy and they're doing the best job they know how. But one of the tips I leave parents with after my talk is to be their child's Google. Don't ever tell your child to go and Google it because kids are hearing stuff out in the playground. You want them to come to you. You want to be your child's Google. So just keep, you know, fostering those relationships. One of the things that we have with the safety team is, you know, once the children have made their safety team is to go and tell, you know, grandma, did you know you're on, you know, so-and-so's safety team and tell them how to handle it as well. So because people need to know that, you know, this little person has chosen you especially that they're going to be able to. So the criteria for a safety team is to help kids find people that listen to them, believe them, be available and then take action if necessary. So to be chosen on a child's safety team is the hugest honour they'll ever bestow on you. So just to let people know that they're on your child's safety team and that, you know, your child knows this program because that alone could be a protective factor. And anything you can say about the parent feeling uncomfortable about talking about those quote unquote taboo topics or uncomfortable topics, a tip or something like that, what can you say to the parent? Well, I can understand why they'd be uncomfortable, but if you can't talk about it, how can we expect a child to talk about it? So we have to just, I hate to be blunt, but we have to just suck it up and have those conversations because I look at it like insurance. If your house is insured, it usually never burns down. On the news, we're always seeing when people's houses burn down, all these poor people, they had no insurance. So they may never, ever need any of this. But if you've given them the tools and you've reinforced, you can tell me anything. Nothing you'll ever tell me will stop me loving you. Kids need to hear that a million times. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You are so passionate. I can feel it. I can feel definitely your passion and you're keeping up with everything, with all the tic-tac and you're everywhere. It seems like keep up your good work. It's important. And it was such a pleasure speaking with you. And thanks, Marcy, for connecting us. Yes. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Holly Ann and Anna. Thank you so much. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener, and I hope you found it helpful. What is your main takeaway from this conversation? I love hearing from you. I welcome your feedback, comments, and questions. You can send me a note to the email info at authenticparenting.com. I prefer audio, so you can call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. And thank you, Lihia, for calling me on my birthday and making my day bright and joyful. For international listeners, you can use the free SpeakPipe tool on the contact page of my website. Go to AuthenticParenting.com forward slash contact and send me a message. If you want to connect with your fellow listeners from around the world, engage in meaningful conversations about the show, get support and answers to your parenting questions, join the Authentic Parenting community on Facebook, a private support group for parents like you. If you love the podcast and find it helpful, show your support by becoming a patron on patreon.com with a small monthly contribution you can make a big difference join other members who believe and support the work of authentic parenting you can find the show and follow it wherever podcasts are played apple podcasts google podcasts spotify and elsewhere and finally if you want to know what i'm up to in my private life see behind the scenes of podcasting, get inspirational content about personal development, healing, and parenting. Follow me on Instagram, the only social media platform that I use. And as always, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. Until next week, I am Anna Seewold. Thank you so much for listening.